Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Pam Peterson Bastin, um, and um, I've been in the substance abuse prevention and treatment field for 32 years this October. I like to say I started when I was 12, in case you're trying to guess my age. Um, and I've done uh, probably 10 to 12 years of that has been in behavioral health with co-occurring mental health disorders. And um, I've spoke with some of y'all about, I think this time last year, um, and uh, I had the opportunity to both work in a substance abuse treatment program in a community for many years, uh, and then I became the state director of substance abuse treatment under two different governors uh, for the state of Florida, and then um, uh, also had the opportunity to run a very large uh, women and kids family-based treatment program um, for uh, women and actually their partners as well who were involved in child welfare. Um, most recently, the last seven years, I've been with the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. Uh, and as the judge said, I've been assigned to Nebraska for um, the past year and a half. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of um, what we've learned in the year and a half that we've been here, uh, particularly as it relates to a court review um, of some files of families that are involved in child welfare. So this is, uh, these are the two federal agencies that support the technical assistance that, that I'm uh, delivering here in um, Nebraska with, with other colleagues, and it's SAMHSA and also the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families Children's Bureau. Um, so these federal agencies uh, who believe strongly in collaboration are actually jointly funding the technical assistance. Um, the only catch to our provision of technical assistance is we have to work with at least three systems at the same time to enhance collaboration, and that is the substance abuse system, um, child welfare, and the courts. And in your state, we also have lar the larger behavioral health system and Medicaid and Department of Corrections and also Federation of Families. Um, so we've got a little bit larger group. So what I'll be presenting today um, is a review of some court cases. Um, this was all funded by the Court Improvement Project, uh, and uh, Vicki Weiss uh, took the lead on this. And what um, they did is they hired some attorneys to um, collect, um, is it 3A, is that right, 3A cases. There were 4,000 um, that they started with, and um, they took uh, a random sample of those, and, and the reason that's important is that the results that I'm fixing to walk you through are very much a representation of the, the kinds of cases that you have in Nebraska because it was a high level of rigor in selecting the um, cases randomly. So the data that, I, that I'll be showing is of your state. And I've, I've been told when I came to Nebraska two things. One, something about a football team, and I am so embarrassed that I don't remember the name because I don't do any kind of sports at all, but that it's a good team and don't say the wrong name, so I just won't say what it is, but good luck with it or whatever. Okay, the other thing was don't ever say anything, um, you know, this works in this state because Nebraska is different. Okay, so I understand Nebraska is different. All right, but this. Uh, presentation in these data that we'll be covering are Nebraska specific. Okay, so first um, wanted to start out with just a quick question. Um, just let me know, uh, and you can just shout out, what percentage of child welfare cases do you think are um, involved uh, with substance use as a, uh, let me say it a different way, how many, what percentage do you think of parents that are involved in the child welfare system have substance use as a factor in the maltreatment? And I don't mean the only factor or the number one factor, but just that it's operating in the background of a child welfare use case. Use. Um, um, I would say use that is a contributing factor to the maltreatment. So it doesn't have to be abuse, but I'm not talking about your, you know, smoking marijuana in the closet once every couple of months. I'm talking about drug use at a level that could contribute to some maltreatment. Whether you would, whether that would technically fall under use or abuse. Can you just maybe give me a rough idea what you think? 70? 80? 70? Yep, 70, 80. That, that's really about the, um, the, the average nationally. Um, your cases showed 56%, and let's show you um, the report. Um, Vicki's holding it up. Do you want to? Do you see? That'd be great, yeah. You know what? They gave me one right here. So the, the, the data that we'll be covering is in this report. Um, and I'll refer you to a few charts from time to time, but basically um, 
56% of the cases had substance use as a factor. Now, it is important to note a couple of things. One, that that's probably a little lower, meaning that, that y'all did not identify all the cases, and, and I'll tell you why that is in a few minutes. But also, this is not to say that these identifications were done in a timely fashion from the beginning when the case came into uh, to be known to the department. It's that it, it bubbled up at some point in the case. In some cases it was up front, in some cases it happened very late, maybe some would argue too late to make a good difference there, um, but, that, but it is being identified 56% of the time. Now, the, um, the states that have done actual prevalence studies show uh, on average 80% of the cases that come into child welfare have substance use as a factor in the maltreatment. So you can see there's a bit of discrepancy. I know Nebraska is different. Whether or not it would account for that amount of difference, I don't believe so, but um, we don't know that for a fact. So we believe that it's under-recognized, um, and there's a large body of research that um, speaks to how treatable of a health condition substance use is, and especially if provided with um, effective treatment. But your 56% your identification um, is in the range of, of a national study done 15 years ago that showed 33 to 66%. But uh, I think one of the most significant uh, findings is that when, when um, we did a polling of, of uh, judges to say, what do you see coming before your court as it relates to child welfare cases? What percentage have substance use as a factor? Uh, they range from 50 to 85%. Um, and then in a, um, we, we did a, a study, um, I think there was about 150 people in attendance um, in um, Lincoln about a year ago, and it was all cross systems uh, were represented in the room, and we ended up with about 45% of them felt that it was 51 to 75%, and 33% said actually 76% or greater. So no matter how you slice it and dice it, we're well over the 50% range of all cases that come before the courts uh, or that have child welfare involvement have substance use as a factor. So, um, so let's say you under-identify, as we believe you are at 56%. Let's say you're only under-identifying by, by 10%. So maybe instead of it being 56%, maybe let's say Nebraska has 66%, which probably is low, um, of all child welfare cases with substance use as a factor. Based on those 4,003A cases that, that were opened in 2009 to look at this uh, for this study, if you under-identified, that means that there are 400 families from that just that cohort alone of those 4,000 cases that have child welfare involvement that have substance use as a factor that nobody ever picked up on, that no one's doing anything about. That's 400 families that may be much more likely to not reunify or take much longer to reunify if that is in the cards for them. Um, and those cases alone represent hundreds of thousands of dollars to the state of Nebraska um, in costs that are associated with untreated addiction. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we should care about this, even if it's not for the, the, the harm to the children or the, um, the emotional needs of the families and, and, and whether or not things are, or we're making reasonable efforts in Nebraska, but even just alone on the cost, uh, there's a good reason to intervene and, and, and increase our identification. Um, okay, so um, let's see, you, you also have a lot of uh, removals, I think more than almost any state in the country. Um, and that's, I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, that is, you, you said you were different, that's one way you're, you're different uh, in, in a way that's um, maybe worthy of looking at it as far as what other alternatives are there, especially given that the whole country is going in the other direction of more in-home care, um, and, and there's some lessons learned in that. Some states have not done it well and ended up with more child deaths because they, they didn't proceed properly, um, and whereas other states are having a lot more success in this area. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, but, um, but we know that the, the out-of-home cases are about 70% child uh, or substance abuse involved. So your out-of-home care is where you've got more substance use than in general uh, for the most part. So um, one thing that, that uh, other states have done is looked at what can they do differently as it relates to this issue. And uh, I just pulled up one statistic. There's, there's a lot more in the state of Georgia, which is one of the 
the leaders in innovative therapeutic uh, housing programs for families affected by substance use and child welfare. But this one in Tennessee alone um, over a 12 year period saved two and a half million um, of taxpayers funds by doing a family based treatment program and they saved another two million by keeping the parents out of jail during that process. And so just one program in a small area in Tennessee saved four and a half million dollars over that uh, time frame by doing something innovative. Um, the, the, the dollars are much bigger when you look at, at the state of Georgia, at California, and some of the larger scale programs. Um, and so, uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some exciting things that might be happening in Sydney, and then also in Omaha and Lincoln. So, um, this is, this is an interesting slide. Has anybody ever met somebody with a substance use problem that that was their only problem? I've done it 32 years, never met a single person, never, not one, that just has substance use. If they have substance use as a problem, then generally there's lots of other issues that are, that are co-occurring. And here you can see um, the substance use cases. This is Nebraska data. This is in your report. The darker bar is if they had substance use involvement. The lighter bar is if they had no substance use involvement. That was detected anyway. Um, so you can see there's a much higher incidence of mental health, of domestic violence, of neglect, um, also of incarceration among those substance use families um, that had child welfare involvement. So that's, that's not really a surprise, and I think most of us in this room understand all of those issues. But, but one thing that we have to pay attention to is because of the complexity of all of those issues, we have to think clearly about the quality of the treatment program that we send someone to, the length of time that they get service, in other words, what is the dosage that they're receiving, and what are the qualifications of the staff. So if we're trying to do the blue light special and hire green as grass staff right out of school to save money uh, in a budget, bad budget year, and we're hiring staff that really don't have a lot of experience, that haven't, maybe they, took a sing maybe they got a degree in psychology and took a single addiction class as part of their degree, is this who's treating your families? Um, do your, you know, we already know that your families have domestic violence, co-occurring mental health problems, more uh, criminal involvement, as well as their uh, maltreatment and substance use issues. So um, who's mind in that store? You know, what is happening there? We're going to delve into that a little bit more. I think you might be surprised some of the things that we've been learning. So, um, you know, uh, we made the case here that lots of other problems co-occur. So these are very complex um, problems that are being treated and um, you really want this, the evidence-based approaches. The, the good news is there are evidence-based approaches now for both substance abuse, mental health, and co-occurring disorders that have been in place, uh, some going on a decade. Um, examples are motivational interviewing or motivational um, enhancement services, which you've probably heard about. Um, also, um, Seeking Safety, which is a trauma program. Um, there's also lots of cognitive behavioral programs. So there are these evidence-based programs that are out there um, that hopefully are happening in some places in Nebraska. We know they're not happening widely, and that is an issue. Um, so um, we talked about domestic violence being an issue. Now let's uh, look at this real quickly. This is uh, um, on your, in your booklet, uh, and some of these you might be able to see a little bit better. This is on page seven. And this is saying, um, when uh, is the pretreatment assessment being um, conducted? And let me stop for those of you who don't understand or know about the pretreatment assessment. Um, this is something that if I accomplish nothing else while I'm here, I hope I have some impact in folks looking more clearly at the, the need for and policy around the, the pretreatment assessment. I want you to picture for a moment a, a mom and some kids and they've been reported for maltreatment and so, so investigators come into the home and they find mom and she's got beer cans piled up everywhere and she's got paraphernalia out and um, she's obviously intoxicated under alcohol or, or other drugs. Um, her house is a disaster, her kids have been maltreated and they swoop in and catch her essentially red-handed with all of the, the obvious drug use around her and she cops to it and says, yep, I need help. I, you got, I have a problem. I want my, I, you're taking my kids. I want them back. I'll do whatever it takes. Send me to treatment. Um, does anyone know what would happen to her, particularly in a rural area of the state of Nebraska? 
Okay, she would be as we are being reported. Now I'm only being I've been told this over and over and over in every city I've been to so far in the last two years. So I'm sure someone will tell me it doesn't always happen this way. But um, she will be told we will need to make you an appointment for a pre-treatment assessment. Now. You don't have to have a PhD or have any experience in substance abuse to, to have your common sense tell you, really, does she, does she really need to get a, a pre-treatment assessment if she's already saying, please send me to treatment, I have a problem, you've taken my kids, I want help? And what would you be told if, if you heard that it would take at least two weeks to get that pre-treatment assessment? Uh, because the circuit rider that hits that region or that part of the state is on a two-week schedule and only shows up every two weeks. What do you think mom is going to be doing when she can't get into treatment right then or she can't get some help right then? Of course, she's going to keep using. That's all she can do. That's all she knows how to do. Um, she has a disease. It's a chronic relapsing condition. It is, it's a brain disease. We'll talk about that in a little bit. She's now been told that she's committed pretty much the most ultimate sin on the planet that she's maltreated her own children so her guilt and shame are typically very high at this point and she's an addict more than likely she's going to do the only thing she knows she is going to resort to the coping skills that she has which which are primarily alcohol and drug use so this will now go on and now what would you be told what would you think if that two-week appointment she was told you can come in that two weeks from Tuesday at four o'clock what if she has another appointment at that time you know, we do this all the time. Moms have multiple appointments at the same time and in different groups don't always compare notes and contrast what scheduling we've done for the same client. Remember how we said mom has domestic violence, mental health, substance abuse, criminal involvement, all these other problems? All of those other case workers are also scheduling appointments for mom. She may have to meet with her probation officer. She may have to meet with a child welfare uh, person. She might have a parenting class she's told she has to go to. She might have a medical appointment. She might be pregnant and have prenatal care issues. Um, and now she's being, t she might have, to, you know, as, as happened in Nebraska uh, from one of our last meetings, we were told of a very sad exact case like this where mom had two appointments on the same day. One was to get her assessment and the other was to maintain, she had to go to her housing authority to re-up her housing um, uh, plan or whatever for public housing. I used to work for public housing for many years and it takes a long time to work your way to the top of a list. And she had, and she had her appointment and um, she had to choose between housing or her child welfare appointment and being not well educated in a fog with her addiction with all the other pressures she had she didn't know that she should say hey wait guys y'all have scheduled me for two things at the same time i need to make a change so she gave one up she gave up her housing appointment well guess what happens when you don't have safe housing and you've got kid issues you you know your kids stay in the child welfare system we do this all the time all the time not just nebraska every state in the country because of a lack of coordination on that level on the case level we often do this so so now she might miss her appointment at four o'clock two weeks on a tuesday down the road or she may not have transportation or she may forget remember why because she's actively using so of course she's not gonna, she doesn't whip out her little day timer and look at her appointment and have her transportation take, you know, she probably doesn't have transportation, she probably doesn't have much support, she's not feeling really good about herself and it's hard to keep up with all this. So she misses that appointment and then guess what happens? She gets to wait two more weeks till the person comes back to that area. And then guess what happens when she finishes her pre-treatment assessment from what we're being told? She gets to be scheduled for her actual ass assessment or evaluation or something. Is that reasonable? Does it, does, that, is that, does it make sense for weeks to tick by and before someone who's saying help me or even let's say they're not saying help me but we know what we know about this disease and, and thankfully we have a lot of research now is we know that you don't have a, a window of opportunity you have a peephole of opportunity. You have a tiny tiny little uh, opportunity right in the crisis moment to maximize that motivation and get the person help and your best help will happen when there is that willingness and those when those days tick by and things get worse and worse there's almost a point of giving up like now it's too late my ASFA cl clock is ticking the developmental clock of that child is ticking and um, we're all scheduling appointments. So, uh, you know, and, and let me say, especially since I'm on tape and I'd like to come back to Nebraska at some future point, I am sure that there are places where this is not happening, where things happen much more timely. And I do know that there is some confusion around the pretreatment assessment. 
We've been told it's not even a requirement, but yet we have communities telling us, oh yes it is, try getting anything done without one. So at a minimum, we have a policy that needs clarification, and we need that clarification to go everywhere in Nebraska so everyone knows what it is that does and does not have to be done relative to a pretreatment assessment. And we need to look at that time frame, and we need to look at what happens after the pretreatment assessment, and you know, can that person, if they hit on whatever the pretreatment assessment elements are that register a drug use, can they immediately then go to the next assessment without having to get scheduled to come back weeks later for whatever the next thing is that's required. Uh, and just so you know, and this is again, and I'm going to ask you to call on your common sense throughout this whole two, two hours. Um, one thing that is happening nationally, and that's one advantage I have from traveling all over the country, I've been every state but two now, and um, states are catching on to this the inefficiencies associated with this whole front end piece of a drug or behavioral health treatment system. We know too that if, we, if, if somebody is heavily involved in drug use, and forget if they also have a mental health issue, that the information that we get when they are in the throes of that addiction in terms of an assessment is hardly worth the paper it's written on. You don't know what is true, what isn't true, it's hard to tease out what is the addiction versus what is the mental health issue. So how, how important is that assessment? You really don't know what you have until several weeks go by, especially if you have somebody in a contained situation where they're not able to use drugs as readily or have access, that you start to be able to discern how much of it is drugs versus a mental illness. Take methamphetamine. Rumor has it you have a little issue with meth out here in this part of the country. So, and if anyone knows anything about that, you know that somebody who's on methamphetamine, if they're getting good meth, looks very, very much like someone who has bipolar disorder, almost indistinguishable in terms of some of their behaviors. So, you know, we put all this emphasis on the pre-treatment assessment and get it done and, you know, weeks go by and all, when really, if they're in active addiction, you don't really even know whether you've got a, a substance abuse problem, a mental health problem, or both. So. A lot of states are doing more ongoing assessment over time, and they, they put a lot less emphasis on that front end piece to say, we'll get a better sense of it as we have more hands on this case and get to, to have more information brought to bear on the case, do better collaboration, and spend more time with, with the person to see what, what they're and looking into their family history and, and all of that. And so, um, you know, I think your, your state would be advised to look at some of those studies uh, to see if it makes sense, you know, to, to maybe do things a little differently, maybe a little uh, more efficient as far as this front end piece. So here is what's happening of where they come to you. So there's very little, 5% uh, or so of these, of these cases from Nebraska were screened, got their PTA, was that pretreatment? Yeah, pretreatment assessment prior to petition. Uh, you wouldn't expect that to be big. It'd be great if it were, but that's not a bad thing. But the screening prior to adjudication, you've got about 35%, 32% or so of the, of the parents being screened prior to adjudication. But what, what's kind of concerning here is you've got 21% and 40%. So you've got 61% of your cases where you don't even know whether it's not documented, whether they got any timely screening or not. And I would sure want to know that if I were looking at reasonable efforts, I would want to know what, what happened and, and what didn't happen. And I'd also, uh, and we're also a little concerned about the screening happened post adjudication. Basically, this, this shows that we're missing some real opportunities uh, to, to capture uh, the, the case at the most optimal stage for intervention and recovery planning. And then here's the evaluation, and I confess, I, I really don't understand all of your rules around pretreatment assessment, assessment, evaluation, what all of these things are. And, and I've had it explained to me, and I still don't understand it. Um, but this is what your evaluation um, shows, kind of a similar pattern, where again, the, most of it, we don't even know, it's not documented. And um, these attorneys poured through every page, and they were even, there was even a calibration done of the attorneys before they opened these randomly selected records to make sure everybody looked at the same thing in the same way, and that they were very thorough. So um, it's just, not, you know, the information is not being provided to the court, that should be provided about what's happening and what these delays are. So what do you think, if you're sitting there and you and mom comes or mom and dad comes before you, you may think and there, you know, you have no, no information about whether they're even showing up for their assessment. 
you may get the sense that they don't care. Mom doesn't care, dad doesn't care. They don't even bother to show up. You, and you might not know that there was a very little effort or maybe not a reasonable effort made for them to show up. And this is, this is perhaps to me the most significant um, uh, chart uh, and that is on page 10. And this one's really hard to defend. I'm just gonna level with you on this. Um, it is taking on average, now this is a median, um, median statistic, 146 days for mom to get to treatment. 146 days, that's four to five months. That is, to me, not excusable. Now, a couple things we do need to say here. One is that that's a median, which means 50% of the cases are even taking longer, which is hard to imagine. Also that 50% are thankfully taking less time than 146 days. Um, and I know you're a rural state, I know you're different, but I also know that we can do better than this, much better than this. Now in fairness, data tells us something happened or did not happen, it doesn't tell us why. So we, don't, we can't say, wow, this is the fault of the drug treatment system. They need to do a better job. We don't know that that's the case. We don't know whether it's the, the managing entity that approves or disapproves who gets in for treatment and who doesn't get in and what the rules are and what all the paperwork requirements are. We don't know whether parents are in jail and they can't get in sooner than, than they are. We don't know, so I need to say that, um, so we can't, but, but we would like to find out a little more about this. And, and the, the dads are a little luckier in that it takes them only 123 days on average to get into treatment. These, this is not good for ASFA, um, and this is not, does not speak in a, in a good way, I don't think, to reasonable efforts. Uh, because now, now you, the addiction has gone uninterrupted more for the most part for four or five more months and your real motivating window of opportunity has long passed um, and um, so some things have been set some bells have begun to ring that are kind of hard to unring at this point um, and that's I think not a good um, stage to set for these families um, so these are the kinds of treatment that they get and this this is also in in your um, report and um, you know, this tells us some things. It tells us that uh, your residential or inpatient is down to about 25% for moms and about 16% for dads. So that means everything else is less than residential. Okay, that, that, that in and of itself isn't necessarily alarming, though one could argue that by the time you get to the point of maltreating your own children, your addiction or your drug use problem is probably of a severity that breezing in and out for a handful of sessions at an outpatient program is probably not gonna cut it. Especially given that chart that I showed you that you already know, your common sense tells you that these are not cases that just have substance use as a problem. So we started poking around a little bit. Well, what are these other, what are these other services that, that moms and dads are getting? And we've been told that in some cases, uh, in fact, la uh, two weeks ago I was told, well, it's not that hard uh, for moms to graduate successfully from these programs because they only have to go for about six weeks uh, in, some, in some parts of the state. And they're, they're just, you know, they, so they go for an hour or two a week for six weeks. Um, that's, that's easy to fake your way through, I don't care who you are. But also, really, six weeks, a couple hours, uh, and, and a lot of times when you look at outpatient, you might say somebody, oh, they, oh, Judge, they've been an outpatient, they were four months in treatment, or five months in treatment. When you look at the dosage, well, really, what did they get? And you factor in no-show rates, oftentimes what you get is somebody who got very little help, very little help, in contrast to the problems that they have in their lives. Um, and so really that's unfair. That's unfair that we set them up for failure. That's unfair that we reunite families when we really maybe didn't do the thorough job we should have done when we had that opportunity in front of us and we didn't maximize it. We don't know whether those staff are well trained. We don't know whether what they get when they show up is any good. We know really very little and yet we're making lifelong decisions, decisions that affect these families for the rest of their lives. And so one suggestion I have is, you know, the, the Court Improvement Project did a heck of a job getting us for the first time in the history of Nebraska, and, and no one else collected these data in this way before now, so I, I really wanna, you know, 
give you some, some positive reinforcement for taking this brave step, even though it may not be all that flattering in some areas, you have to know your baseline. You gotta know where you are, and they're in a state in the country that can't make improvements, but you gotta know where those improvement opportunities are and maybe what some next steps are. And so one suggestion, in addition to looking at that whole pre-treatment business, is to look at the treatment part. What is happening? Um, are these really appropriately dosed appropriately delivered by qualified staff. Uh, and these are some of the questions I would be asking um, right now, uh, especially given these data. Um, so we need, to, we need to look at the dosage and um, we need to look at the, the, um, the, uh, the staff. And before we take a break, I'm going to show you just two more slides here. And, and I think this, would, this makes the best case. And I apologize if some of you have seen this before. I know I've shown it in Nebraska once before. So in a, a state that I work in, like, like Nebraska, we decided to do a um, review to say who is the typical family that we're serving in this state. And so we did um, an extensive, also through court improvement, review of records in the state to say who is the typical family. And this is who we got. Uh, mom, on average, is 28 years old, seven months pregnant, no prenatal care, and got three kids, ages two, four, and eight. And I like to stop here and say just let that resonate for a moment. Imagine being seven months pregnant and having a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and an eight-year-old. And think about what that must be like. My heart's racing and I'm you know, just even thinking about what that, the chaos that must exist in, in a family like that. And especially when you think that, remember we showed the profile, there's all kind of other issues in that family. It's not just a drug problem, okay? So, um, and the mother's drug use history, she's got a 12 year history, heroin, cocaine, alcohol, and marijuana. She has co-occurring mental health problems. She, her criminal history was drugs, panhandling, and domestic violence. Um, she, her, she has a 10th grade education, no GED. Her employment status is um, very shaky. Um, she doesn't have any stable employment and she's fixing to get some sanctions from Tana for her no work status. She had two prior involvements with the child welfare system. Um, she has two dads of those soon to be four children. Uh, one's in jail, no child support. The mother is on multiple economic assistance programs. She lives in public housing, which she's probably gonna lose because of a drug charge. Because we, we do that in this country. We, we have these policies that make sense to the, to the system that makes it. Like we don't want anybody with any drug history in our buildings, so we're gonna kick them all out. So then the problem moves over here to the homeless department who now gets the mom and the kids living under the bridge and the state pays the same amount of money or more usually more or they end up in jail you know so we just move the problem around from one system to another largely without really looking at it as a system to see well is there a better solution so she'll lose her public housing one child does have a medical issues with sickle cell anemia and they searched for family strengths and, and could not identify any. I, I've got to believe every family has some strength and the fact that this woman could put two feet on the floor every morning and keep going with all this chaos is, is maybe her strength. But so you think about a family like this and then you say to this mom, listen, pop in for a handful of outpatient sessions and we're going to tune you right up and you get right back out there and you parent those kids. And she's probably a third generation um, child welfare involved family, as we know is often the case. Um, she's probably never had a single role model uh, example of how to parent her children. Um, so she may be doing the very best she can possibly be doing given what she has to work with. And so it's easy to get mad at these moms and these families. It's easy to say, how could you do that to your children? But when you take a step back and you look at the big picture as we're doing here, and especially when you think about the multiple, um, the, uh, the, the impact of trauma, uh, if this, this woman was, and we know she's a, a victim of domestic violence with the men that are in her life, but we don't know um, um, what her own, and we probably could find out, past history as a child was with, with child welfare. But, you know, you really think about somebody like this, and, and when I go around to, when I was in, um, I spoke at the, uh, the um, American Bar Association a few, maybe it was a month or two ago in DC, and I threw this slide up and there was all kind of states represented. And I said, does this look at all familiar? And everybody was shook their heads and said, yeah, that's kind of like our families. And one woman said, except add immigrant status and then you'll have our families. And so, you know, you pile that on. I know in Nebraska, we're not supposed to really talk about that, but basically we know they're there, right? And we know that they're getting services or somehow. So, you got all kind of issues here and popping in and out for a few outpatient sessions. If that's what's happening, again, we don't understand the dosage. I understand you have the data that could let us know this. Um, I think that's through Magellan and might require some, um, 
some assistance leadership wise at a state level to access but but the data is there so we we can add a little bit uh, more to this picture um, but this is what what I want to talk about and we'll spend the rest of the um, the morning session I'd like to give you a break if that's all right um, t is 10 minutes okay yeah and I don't even have a watch so what Thirteen, okay. Okay, so I um, uh, want to read you a definition of addiction that um, really, I think, speaks to some of these complexities we're talking about. So it's a core concept um, that has been evolving with scientific advances over the past decade that drug addiction is a brain disease that develops over time as a result of the initially voluntary behavior of using drugs. And that's important to say, yes, there was initial voluntary behavior. And so a lot of people will say, well, they deserve what they get or you know, they, they should do something about it. Well, the truth is it does start with that first pickup. But um, what happens, especially if you have a pre-existing um, or uh, if you're predisposed to use because of your family history, um, it becomes a very uh, uncontrollable compulsive drug craving, seeking, and use that interferes with, if not destroys, an individual's functioning in the family and in society. Um, this is a medical condition that demands treatment. Oh, am I having a problem? I was trying to take my birth control, but they were thinking, what, what else? Oh, God. I'm sorry. I, I really would have worn something different if I had known. Put it here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There. Sorry. All right. So that's the definition. Um, this is just a quick visual to, to show you that brains are literally rewired uh, by drug use. And, um, and so we can't expect the same kind of functioning from somebody who has this, this history. So here's an, uh, a picture of the brain. The one on the far left is a healthy person. The one in the middle is a meth user that has one month of abstinence. And then uh, the last one on the far right is 14 months of abstinence. So um, what you can see is, you know, that, that you, the good news is you can, your brain can, in most cases, restore functionality over time with increased abstinence. But what happens is, look at that, uh, the, the functionality in the brain of a one-month abstinent meth user. Um, the, the, the circuits are not all firing. All of the, um, the capacity that a person would have to be able to reason, to make good decisions, to understand uh, information and to process that is depleted. And so what's happening to us in that first, what, what happens to mom the first month you know, uh, a lot of it may not, or mom or dad, may not be registering, and that's when we're giving her all her appointments and all the things she has to do and all this kind of information and may literally almost be going in one ear and out the other. Yes? What does the red indicate? Is that activity? That is, a, um, those are dopamine receptors, and uh, I don't even understand all what that is, and I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I will not be able to explain that to you, but I, I would say that basically um, it, ha it does have to do with the pleasure, um, you know, your ability to perceive pleasure, and if you don't have that, the only way you get that is for continued drug use to, to be able to feel good or even normal. Um, requires that um, use and so um, but it does affect reasoning it affects judgment and it affects um, understanding um, and so um, you can see that it, and it's almost about 15, 14 months so well over a year before you get close to the uh, normal functioning but um, the uh, and, and it, every drug is different and it depends on what other drugs they're taking and what kind of uh, volume and combination of drugs and so forth so everybody's different but but what it speaks to is it adds again another level of complexity to this issue and and also the need for us to understand um, that just because we tell mom go to this appointment at two o'clock next Thursday that somehow she's going to remember that and and go and 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 understand everything that's told to her at that time so um, 
it, it does require uh, states that have been very responsive to um, these issues have what they call peer support or peer um, specialists that are persons in recovery that kind of take someone by the hand and literally walk them through the system and to all the appointments that they have to be at and making sure that they understand that and that they ask a lot of questions they repeat a lot of information um, and they're very concrete because they remember what a fog they were in years ago especially if they were in recovery and um, so they know how important it is to do that so this is uh, just to show you that relapse is, is uh, in this medical condition of addiction is really no different than relapse in any other medical condition. Uh, diabetes, hypertension, and asthma being good examples. Um, and so just like relapse occurs in those conditions, it occurs in addiction and will occur, you know, about 50% of the time. Um, you, and what typically happens is when the person is feeling really good for the first time after you know getting out of of, a, of the um, primary phase of their addiction, when they start feeling really good and they start getting a few tools under their belt from being in treatment, then they say, "Wow, now I can handle my manage my drug use because now I'm strong. I've got some tools in my tool chest. I can get out there and just do a little bit and still manage." And they can't, but they don't always know that till they try. Um, and so that's one reason. Uh, an untreated partner is the number one reason for relapse, which is another reason why ignoring the boyfriends, the partners, the husbands, and pretending they don't exist is really not uh, a smart thing to do. Because especially if they are a parent to those kids, they will be in mom's life for many years. And so it's very quick for them to undo the damage that was done, uh, and, or excuse me, to undo the progress that was made with, with mom and the kids. And so some level of, of uh, involvement of that partner is key. Um, this is just a, a sense of, just so you see the different kinds of levels of care. So when you send somebody to treatment, you may not know what kind of treatment they're getting. Um, and these are the, what's called ASAM levels of care. Early intervention is 0.05, outpatient is level one, intensive outpatient, residential, medically managed inpatient or opioid maintenance therapy. So those are all the different kinds of treatment. So it's important uh, for you to ask a couple of questions when someone says that mom has been to treatment or the parents have been to treatment. One is what level of care did they get? And one question you have to ask yourself is what level of care did they need versus what level of care did they get? And this is a big problem in Nebraska. They might have needed residential, but it wasn't available. So is that reasonable? Is that a reasonable effort? If somebody, if we know the data and the record is so clear that she needs a level of care and it's not available, so we set her up for failure and dump her in something that is not maybe the right level of care, that's like saying, wow, you know, you need brain surgery or cancer treatment, but we're gonna give you, um, you know, help with your leg. And you're like, really? Because I had a much bigger problem than that, you know? So it it's, it's just speaks to the availability versus the need. Um, Sometimes you have misalignment here, not because it's not available, but because the person doing the assessment didn't have all the information. So um, if you're not having good collaboration across the systems, and I'm the, the counselor at the assessment unit or whatever that is doing the pre-treatment assessment or the post-pre-treatment assessment evaluation or whatever you call these things, if I'm the one responsible for those and all I have is mom sitting in front of me and I have nothing from the child welfare staff that tells me what, what conditions her, were found when she was, you know, her kids were taken out of her care, let's say, and I may not know that there was drugs hanging out or that she's, this is her second time in care because of a drug problem. I may not know she has an arrest. And she's saying, I don't know why I'm here. Don't know. Uh, yeah, I was just told to come down here and if I want my kids back, I have to, so I'm here. And so that worker doesn't have a crystal ball. Now, hopefully they're very seasoned and they have ways to probe and to follow up and, and good questions to ask to get to the nitty gritty. But if not, and they're very green, they're not gonna do that. And if they don't have information, they're not gonna have the full picture. So they may say, well, wow, you can get by with a .05 or you can get by with outpatient. Um, when what they really needed was something much more significant. Um, the other thing is with managed care, with a lot of the changes in, in health reform, there will be less and less residential being paid for in every state in the country, which is another reason why that apartment model is so key, is you need to simulate the intensity and the holistic approach to the family that you get in an apartment model, but for the cost of outpatient. Um, that's the only way we're gonna be able to pull that off in this economy, in this state, or really in any other state, because um, that's 
going to be harder to pay for. Um, so this is just the, the, uh, the way that that looks. Um, so, um, you know, one question is, what does time to treatment look like in your jurisdiction? And, and one question I have is, uh, and does, does anybody have a sense of how long it takes when you refer families um, to, get, to get an assessment and then later to get to treatment? What are your experiences? Can I look at this for a minute? It goes a little quicker if it's outpatient, but 45 to 60 days for residential. And that, that's faster than what the data says, so that's, that's good to know. Is that everybody else's experience also? Or longer, yeah. Or longer, okay. The issue becomes the more rural we get, the harder it is for families to figure the logistics out. And mm -hmm. sometimes that's And what is your sense of what they get dosage-wise when somebody says, oh, Sally went to outpatient and completed, was she going, did she get a, a lot of neat services or was it very brief? Was it more drug ed? Was it, what kinds of, what does treatment, what does that really mean? Or, or and you might not know, but does anybody have a sense? I saw a heads nodding on, is it more drug ed related? I think it's more drug education in our area. Right. Right. to get in. It's a long time. And drug ed, does, does knowing how many chemicals are in marijuana or that a certain drug is bad for you or that you don't mix this drug with that drug, what does that do for the fact that you had the crap beat out of you your whole life and now you're doing that to your kids? Or that you have no GED or you have no job or that you deal with incredible sexual abuse and trauma every time you see your partner or that you have no job skills or you, I mean, I mean, common sense would tell you, really? What does that have to do with anything? Um, you don't think they know? I mean, does knowing that drugs are harmful fix the problem? N no, it's, that's never worked. And in the 32 years I've been in the business, um, aside from one, one entity that used to push that approach years ago, um, there's not a shred of research that says it's a knowledge thing. So we've, we've got you know some, some hard questions to ask and some, um, maybe some, some redesign of some things. So, um, you know, so that whole engagement piece is critical, getting them engaged at that window of opportunity and getting them into treatment. Um, okay, so, um, and we do want to conduct some kind of follow-up on these data that are in your report to see what is really happening here. So here's the example of um, the clocks. You know, TANF has a clock. If you're working, uh, if you're not working and you're on economic assistance, you have so many days, weeks, months, whatever, to get a job. Um, and that you're limited to how much money you can get during a time frame. And some of that's driven federally with some um, state uh, involvement. And then you've got the ask the time clock, which uh, deals with how many uh, months of out-of-home care a child can be in before a, a plan um, is um, for parental rights is put in place and before you have termination. Um, you've got recovery, the recovery clock, that's one day at a time for the rest of your life. And you have the child development clock, which does not, um, which is, is very quick and doesn't stop. But it moves at its fastest rate from prenatal to age five. And then there's the fifth clock, which is ticking on us. How long is it going to take us to figure this out? How long is it going to take us to say, you know, we can do better. We can do this faster. We can do this more holistically. We can be more family focused. Um, we can ask the hard questions. We can hold people accountable for the answers. Um, and, you know, we don't have all the resources we need, but we sure can do a whole lot better with what we have. Um, and that's the clock that I, I think we all need to answer to, and not just Nebraska, but, but every place. Um, okay, so I want to show you um, a couple other things. Um, we've already talked about that. One thing that is concerning, and this is uh, near the end of your report, and this is, and Vicki, I might need your help with this one. This is the, um, the, the blue is where fam the, the parents got only drug testing without any treatment. 
like drug testing is treatment. Is that what that, that's basically what that's. And it's drug testing with no treatment ever. Ever. So it's not like drug testing for a couple of weeks until you get into treatment, but substance abuse was identified as a problem and they got drug testing in blue. And, but there was never any treatment. And then the green at the very end, they were getting drug testing, but there never being any evidence of substance abuse problems being in the record except for the drug testing. So and and that, that's a, luckily a small number. I mean, it wouldn't be a big resource savings if that didn't happen, but, but the blue right. is really concerning. It's, it's so, I, don't, I worry that the message is getting back in court that somebody's involved with drugs something or other when all they're getting is drug testing. And we, we know enough about drug testing, um, ways to beat drug testing. If you don't think people that use drugs know how to beat the drug test, you're wrong. They know every way in the book. Um, in, in Key West, I remember the, the one that baffled me was um, um, we would do temperature and color checks of the urine screens. And this gal would, she'd take saffron, that spice, and she'd put it on her stomach and she would put her finger in it and dip it in her water um, that she pretended was her, her urine uh, so that it looked the right color. I mean, it's bizarre what people will go to, to be able to, they'll use urine from their children, you know, strap it in and put it in a Visine bottle, strap it to their leg. It can look like they're, you know, even if you're monitoring, it can look like it's there it's, it's not um, so you don't want to hang your whole case on on a drug test and what does a drug test tell us anyway it tells us absolutely nothing about that parent's ability to parent all it tells us is they have drugs in their body at a particular point in time that's all it tells us and the, the folly to this whole thing is alcohol alcohol is used more than any other drug in this state and in most other states except I think Connecticut, where prescription drug use has taken over, and so is heroin. But almost every state in the country, alcohol is the number one drug used, or the number one substance used, okay? So um, all of the, per if parental maltreatment can occur from just alcohol misuse and abuse, and then we're over here scurrying around just making sure there's no illicit drugs in their system, and when we think about how many illicit, how many prescription drugs people take with a prescription, but they misuse it, they, they doctor shop, they get multiple prescriptions, so they'll test for a drug that they might have a script for, and we say, oh, sh that's good, at least you know, they had a prescription for that. We're missing the whole point. It's not about the percentage or the number of, of uh, milligrams or nanograms of drugs in somebody's urine or blood. It is, it is what is their capacity as a parent are they a safe parent or not? And what should we do about that? So this is all, I don't want to say it's totally bogus. It is a, a tool, one tool, in what should be a much bigger picture of looking at, at families. Yeah. I have a question for you. So let's say that they, these were all um, not, they were accurate urinalysis tests and people weren't cheating them. And I guess the question is, and I don't, and this is sort of maybe for the judges and other people here too, but for you in terms of the science. Um, can a person who has a drug and alcohol problem, or how likely is it that a person with a drug or alcohol problem that is sufficiently developed so that they lose their children, mm -hmm. the child welfare, uh, be able, and, I mean, it seems to me that it is likely that highly motivated people might be able to go drug free for six weeks or eight weeks. I mean, do you think that's somewhat likely? But how likely is it for people to sort of self-treat and then have that problem go away without Okay, treatment? great question, actually. So I can honestly say in 32 years, I have never one time once met somebody who successfully treated themselves from alcohol and drug addiction over the long term. Now, there are people who have tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. I'm sure less than 5% but tiny percentage. I have met people who have been able to have periods of abstinence under pressure of courts or losing the marriage or losing a job. I have seen that, but it's very short-lived and, and recurs because they didn't get any help for the underlying problems. Um, you know, that, the, all those things that we showed on the screen and lots of other things. So that's magical thinking, you know, literally. And I'm sure we all know one person somewhere that did it once, you know. But the reality is, if we're honest, 
This does not happen. People do not cure themselves. They don't treat themselves successfully. They may have short periods of abstinence to get through a bad time and they will pick up again. It's the nature of the disease and without the proper treatment. So um, that's why you see, so you look, just look at your own. Don't believe me, look at your own repeat maltreatment cases and tell me how many times substance use is a factor in it. Almost all of them. Look at your child deaths. How many of them had substance use? Almost all of them. Every state in the country. No exceptions. That is the consequence of not doing it right the first time, of not looking at the whole family, not being in-depth, comprehensive, and sufficient, sufficient dosage. Um, now, and I, I gave this example um, last time, and, and I think it, it makes it more concrete, and, and this is a cancer example, but I have a girlfriend who had breast cancer, and she, um, she literally went to all kinds of cancer specialists and she got a plan worked out and they basically told her this. Okay, you, you know, she had breast cancer. So if you do nothing, your chances of survival five years are this percent. If you do um, a, a um, lumpectomy, these are your chances. If you do a mastectomy, your chances are this. If you add radiation, if you add chemo and so forth and so on, these are your chances, these are your chances. We should really be doing this to these families. We should say, you know, if you don't go to treatment, your chances of keeping your kids based on our data are pretty slim, and here's what our data shows. If you do go to treatment, your chances increase 50% of getting your kids back, and here's what our data says. If you add AA and NA onto your treatment, this is a chance you're gonna have if you stay engaged, you know, and, and so forth and so on. We have the data that should be able to help families make informed choices. Because a lot of times you'll have parent attorneys tell their parents, don't go to treatment, don't cop to this, don't cop to that. And, that's a, and that happens in a lot of states. That's in the states that have some of these innovative recovery programs, that doesn't happen anymore. The attorneys can say, your, your choice. But here's what I can tell you. Here's our data in our state, and this is your chances if you don't go to treatment, you know, your your call but um you know and in, in california and in several states that have big innovative treatment systems the attorney the parent attorney is the biggest advocate to go to treatment um, so you know these are all the kind of prickly issues people don't always like to talk about but um the reality is that um that the, the chances are almost non-existent, uh, just minuscule, like you'd have a better chance of getting struck by lightning and, and getting, winning the lottery on the same day uh, to be able to treat yourself. It just doesn't happen. So then I have a follow-up question. So the court and their court orders and you know, holding parents accountable, they have to do something, ask for something that's objective and uh, fair. And I, think, I, mean, I think a lot of court orders, you know, they may look at being drug-free for a period of time and as something that the parents are supposed to achieve. And I bet the drug testing is, is one of the ways right. that they're doing that. But if you, how would you frame what it is that yep. the courts might um, order in yep. terms of some evidence that the person has actually got more capacity Going, to yeah. Uh, great question. Four things, and, and there, there's a tool that we have that's free that we've you know, made available, and, and I don't think anybody's taken us up on it in Nebraska, but there's a report that's one page and it has four things that I think every judge would want. And it says, how many times did this parent, was this parent supposed to go to treatment, and how many times did they show up? So they were supposed to go four times in week one and six times in week two, and, da -da, and how many times did they show up in the month? The parent was supposed to get this many drug screens. How many did they take? Because if, if, you, if you don't show up for one, we call that a presumptive positive in, in, the, in the way we do it. Okay, so that would be how many drug screens were they supposed to have and then how many um, did they, and then what was the result? And then how many case management meetings were they supposed to have? Because presumably these people have lots of other issues in their life that they need help for. So they have a case management or some peer recovery. How many of those and how many did they go to? And how many AA and NA support group meetings were, was it recommended they attend and how many did they go to? Now, not only do you have four concrete measures that all put a little piece of the puzzle in place, but you have it over time. You have month one, month two, month three. And what you should see for a typical client is sometimes they take three steps forward and two steps back. So, you know, it's not always gonna be perfect, but when you look at the big picture, you should see incremental progress. And if you consistently, consistently see incremental progress, you should feel better about continuing on with what, what that plan is for to support that, that parent or those parents' recovery. So simple, no, no money, 
The tools available, we've given it to Nebraska over the last year and a half, we'll give it to you again. Um, it's a no-brainer, and it's just, it's not a perfect, it's not a silver bullet, but it, it is for objective measures. You might have other measures you prefer, but how much better is that? And the nice thing about that is it gets to the issue of dosage. Was, and that's when you find out, oh my God, I thought mom was going to treatment and she's going to a six week drug ed class. You'll find that out because it'll, that'll be obvious when she was only supposed to come once a week for an hour. You might say, really? What? Wow, she has a lot of issues. What's happening in that hour? Help me understand what she's getting. How do I know that that's reasonable to line up with you know, the, the cancer that she has and you're putting a Band-Aid on it? You know, that's not reasonable. So I think that is a tool that can help generate some of that conversation. Um, Okay, so uh, we've already made this point about drug testing. It does not equate with treatment. It is not treatment. Um, how am I doing on time? 45 minutes. Oh, really? Gosh, I'm not, apparently I'm not talking fast enough. So here we go, page 11. Very important. Um, and it's probably easier for you to see here than it is on the screen. So those files, those 4A, 3A cases that were reviewed, of which there were 4,000 and, and they did the random sample to 400, um, looked at what happened to these folks that had um, substance use issues. So um, you'll see that there were 211 or 56% of the cases, those 3A cases, had some indication of substance use. Um, need to make the point again, in some cases this, this discovery of substance use was way too far into the case. So mom or dad may not have gotten a real good shot at treatment or a timely shot, but at least they picked it up somewhere. Okay, so 56%. Then you see 75 or 73% of them had at least one parent that got referred for an assessment or an evaluation. And from those, 98% um, actually received an assessment or an evaluation. That's probably your biggest strength or the best news of all of this whole thing is that there's a very high percentage that was supposed to get an assessment that actually got one. Now, what, what it doesn't say is it might have taken them five months to get that, okay? But they did get it, okay? So that, that you ha so you have presumably the information you need if it was done by a qualified person and if they had all the benefit of the information that was available on that family. Then 111 or 74 percent of the cases received an evaluation or assessment and had at least one parent identified as needing treatment. So on its face that looks good. That says, wow, you know, when we thought there was a problem, 75 percent of the time there was a problem. So that, that means, what would you say, that that's a, um, there aren't a lot of false positives. In other words, there weren't a lot of people that we said, yeah, we think they have a drug problem. Then they get to the evaluation and they say, oh, we were wrong, they don't. So that, that's a good number. Now, that number, I will tell you why I think it's so high, because that that's a pretty good figure. I think it's so high because you're only identifying in Nebraska the real obvious cases. The ones that are more subtle are not being detected. And so that substance abuse will trip up those cases and you will see those cases back again and again. So I think the reason you're, you're good on this positive uh, identification is that when you do identify, and it's real obvious, that yeah, it proves to be a, a true substance problem that, that needs treatment. That's just a hypothesis. I don't have any evidence for that other than a year and a half of, of conversations and data reviews and, uh, and meetings that have gotten me to that conclusion. And I'll tell you the other reason why I, I'm positive about this myself. Um, for a problem that, by your estimates, are 70 to 80 percent of the cases in child welfare, what, per, what so that's by far the, the majority of the cases have substance use as a factor. How many hours of training do you think your child welfare staff get in substance use? disorders. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Two to four hours, which is woefully, woefully inadequate. You cannot take, I don't care what problem it is, if a problem is big enough that 70 to 80 percent of the cases suffer from it, if it's a problem that we know is connected to seven other problems that we showed you in your own state with your own data on your own bar graphs, and we know how much money is tied up in repeat maltreatments coming back again and again. We know you have one of the highest out-of-home state placements in the country. 
again, you know, because in substance use is a huge factor there. Um, we can do better than that. We're, we're just not picking this up early when it's more, you know, treatable. We're getting it at a more intractable level of addiction instead of catching it early the first time out, you know, and, and being able to manage it in a more effective and a more successful manner. So uh, then we get down to 98% of the cases had at least one parent receive a treatment referral. Um, and of those 86% um, started treatment. So, um, you know, really to me the question is, I want to know what are the child welfare outcomes of the parents that went to treatment and those that either dropped out or didn't go over time. So how many reunified, how long did it take to reunify and did that hold or was there repeat maltreatment? In California, and I shared with this before with, with uh, the last group uh, last year, that um, they saved $17 million in Sacramento on just the money saved from more speedy reunification, so it was less out-of-home money being spent in foster care, and also um, in more reunifications and less cost for adoptions. $17 million. So one county or one area, it's a big area of Sacramento, but still. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to do this and, and those kinds of funds that maybe don't have to be spent in, in more um, costly ways could be channeled to more effective therapeutic programming for families. But back on the training, um, we have made, we have two sets of training that we've made available for free to the state of Nebraska. One is a four hour online course that you can go on and take. One, one is, um, for, if you're from the judicial system, it's explaining addiction and, and child welfare. There's another course if you're child welfare explaining the judicial and the substance abuse. And if you're substance abuse, it explains both judicial and, subs and welfare, child welfare. So it takes, takes it from different angles for those three types of professionals. Four hours free and you get CEUs. Now I know we're still trying to get y'all CLEs from that. Um, and, and I understand you have a provision against home studies or something for CLEs, but why I'm hoping it would pass here is that it's competency-based. So you can't proceed to the next slides unless you get the right answers. So it's not like you could be making out your grocery list while the online course is on your computer. You have to interact with it and you have to be able to pass the test questions. And it has all kinds of great information and tools you can download, including the one I described of the, the instrument that has the four progress points. That's one of the tools you get when you take the course. We also have a 30-hour course for child welfare workers that's free, that we give you every handout, every PowerPoint, everything you could need to prepare child welfare workers to do a better job of identifying substance abuse and to how to manage it. Nobody's taken us up on it, it's a year and a half for free. So, you know, we keep, I keep raising it, you know, um, hoping we've offered all kind of support to help you get that going. You can do it module by module. You can do it all at once. You can do it once a month for two hours. If there's any way you can break it down to make it fit your state. Some states have embedded it in their Child Welfare Training Academy. It's already been vetted and approved by the feds, both the, the, the two agencies I showed you at the front end of the presentation, um, who govern these funds for child abuse and neglect and also substance abuse. And so it's, there's, it's like, to me, it's a no-brainer, especially when you only have two hours that you're doing now uh, for, for what is such a huge problem. Um, so while we expect to have drop-off in any system, um, you know, you're going to, ideally, what you want that drop off to look like is a straight line. Everybody who you think you identify might have a problem gets in for timely assessment, they get where they need to go, they complete treatment, and they have good child welfare outcomes. You want to see that. But you're all, you know, it's never going to be perfect. You, you're going to have some drop off. But the thing to remember is the drop off um, points, those clients don't go away. They don't just drop out of sight, out of mind. They continue drinking and drugging and maltreating and whatever else they're gonna do. And you take their kids and then sometimes they have more kids. And so the problems don't go away. They continue to cost the state of Nebraska a lot of money and, they, and not to mention the social and emotional costs associated with all of the, the trauma with these families. Um, I shared with you um, the, uh, I think last year, but just in case I didn't, we did this in New Jersey, one of my other states. And we did it on the whole state. You did a, you did, yours is a, is a random sample of 10% of your cases. That's what these numbers are for Nebraska. We did it on all of them in New Jersey. And um, we then looked at how much money is currently in, being spent just to get people from point, that top point down 
to the treatment front door. Anybody want to take a guess as to how many, um, how much money New Jersey was spending just to get people to the front door? Um, let me let me tell you that we started with about 16,000 cases that that are identified. They, New Jersey looks at they screen every parent for substance abuse because they know it's 80% of their caseload. Some states even have a rule out checklist. You have to rule. You have to, they assume substance use is a factor, and if it's not, the child welfare worker has to say, that substance use is not a factor in this case, check. And a lot of people aren't willing to do that because they, they know. So anyway, your state doesn't do either of those, but the substance abuse, they check for every case in, in, in um, New Jersey. So they started out with 16, and guess how many ended up finally making to treatment? You guys aren't real talkers, so I guess I'll just, plus. 800. Started with 16,000, only got 800 to treatment. And the amount of money that that cost? $12 million to get 800 people to treatment. That didn't even cost, pay for the cost of the treatment, okay? That's to get them to treatment. I would venture a guess that your state would have something very similar, and as does every other state. But you know why? Nobody asks these questions. People gather data, every system has these data. But nobody gets together and says, well, let me look at your data compared to my data. I wanna look at how many people I find in child welfare with a substance use problem. Let's see how many of those are getting to treatment. Hey, I have a bold concept. Let's look at those that get to treatment. Are their wealth, child welfare outcomes any better or worse? Let's know, is the treatment any good? Let's take a look at what kind of treatment, what kind of qualifications. There's so many things that can be done with existing resources. So what we're doing in New Jersey, is we, we did say, we don't want anyone to lose their contracts because we, and, and, and not the first shot. We said, we'll do amnesty because we weren't going to get providers to, to play if we were going to cut their contracts. So we said, we want, we'll give you amnesty for a couple of years as long as you roll up your sleeves and we all work together because it's not any one system's fault. You know, what we found out in New Jersey is a lot of times the, the right information from child welfare was not getting to the addiction person's um, information you know, level. So they were making assessments with partial information. There was plenty of fault to go around. So we are doing a, a total reform there that we're already beginning to have quite a bit of success with in um, doing better training, getting people to understand more. We're looking at, uh, we've divide, de developed a peer recovery model. We're taking existing staff that weren't doing a very good job in these processes and, and hiring instead people in recovery with several years under their belt to help people navigate so we don't lose them at all these junctions, these transition points. Um, we're making sure we have evidence-based treatment. We're looking at having more of those in-home family models, um, family treatment models. So there's a lot of, of things planned and we will continue to look at that data now that we have a baseline and say, is any of this working? If not, what other direction? So I, I think the point is managing your system and, and I don't see that happening here. There's a lot of data being collected, there's a lot of information, but nobody's really managing the system um, as it relates to this issue. So, um, so they don't drop off and they don't go away. Um, the problems continue to stay. Um, and um, so what are some solutions? You know, one is um, there's a company called Niatex in Wisconsin and they look at what's called rapid cycle change. So they look at what can we do to make improvements in processes that are not working? So that the biggest improvement they've made around the country is to stop the, the, the scheduling of appointments. That, that's relatively meaningless. So what they've done is they've said, you have a drug problem, come on down. Monday through Friday, or sometimes it's Saturday, nine to five, we have somebody at our center who will make sure you get assessed when you are ready for it. Bring it, anytime, any place. And, and of course, there are some hand ringers out there, oh, we can't give up our appointment schedule, what will happen if they all show up at once? And they don't. And the, uh, on the odd occasion that they do, they have magazines, a pot of hot coffee, some kids' toys to keep people busy. Uh, folks are just happy to know that they can get help when they need it. Um, the, in the best statistic I've seen of all the NIATEX uh, rapid change projects that looked at abandoning the appointment uh, schedule was they had a 287% increase in clients assessed using the same dollars. No additional money. Why? Because before they had, when they had appointments, they had no-shows. You give somebody an appointment three weeks out, a month out, 
they, and they're in active addiction, you saw the brain slides, they're not going to show up. So you have a counselor sitting there waiting for someone who's not showing up. Someone's paying that counselor's salary. So when they went to no appointments, people show up. They show up when they're ready to show up and they're, they're motivated. And so the, the, it's a lot more successful. Not only did it cost no money, but they saved money. They had 287% increase using existing funds. Um, so there's lots of other, those rapid change projects, we can even help you do those. And, and that's especially for folks that aren't ready to make a change. Like, oh, I don't know if I can give up that. And I'd love to start one with the pretreatment assessment. Let's try a pilot with no pretreatment assessment and see if we get people in faster and if it really made a difference, the pretreatment assessment. Now, someone isn't gonna like that. Whoever gets to bill for it, it's probably not gonna be thrilled to miss that. Maybe they can catch that up somewhere else because they know organizations have to survive and, uh, and they are there to provide a service and they probably don't want that taken away and I don't blame them. But there's gotta be a service that might make a little more sense if, as, if it is happening as it's being described to us. We need to look at the right level of care. You know, is it, do we know that the people are getting the level of care that they're being assessed? Um, and is that person doing the assessment? Um, do they have the skills to get the, to understand what the right level of care is? Do they have all the information from the child welfare agency? Do they know what they're really dealing with when they make a level of care recommendation? Do they have the right expertise to ferret that out? Is treatment evidence-based? That's a simple question you can ask of your treatment providers. Hey, I know we, you've been providing treatment for many years. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Is it based on any research evidence? What's the name of it? Maybe Google it, see what you can find out, do a little research um, and, and find out um, what, what percentage of people succeed in that treatment. How many of them end up coming back again and relapsing? Um, is your treatment individualized or family focused? Um, and I'm going to show you a, a graph here in a minute that, that I think you'll see very little bit of your treatment is family focused now. Um, gender specific, you know, does it deal with the abuse, the neglect, the trauma, the, um, the sexual issues that are present? Um, is it trauma informed or trauma specific? And so what would it mean for Nebraska to get those kinds of things? You know, that would be a very different, um, you'd be in a very different position. This is one of the resources that we make available. It's free, it's got where you can download it yourself or we can give you hard copies. Um, in the 32 years that I've been doing this work, I think this is about the best example in this document of what family-centered treatment looks like. And I have a graph that I'm gonna show you here real quick. Um, and it's in much more detail in this manual. And basically, it, it, it's a way that you can assess or is the treatment that you're sending people to, and this is in your handouts, um, is it family focused? So, for example, uh, if it's a women's treatment um, center that has family involvement, the services are for women, um, and the treatment plan might have a couple family issues addressed on it, but really the goal of the treatment is for mom to get better. And that's how the majority of drug treatment is, even women-specific treatment. It's mostly about mom, just like child welfare seems to be mostly about the kids. Um, and you can see all the steps that go into it, but when you get to the, the fifth level, which is the ideal level of family treatment, every family member has a treatment plan. Now, how bold of a concept is that? Every family member, because the addiction has affected every one of those family members and will trip them up in one way or another. And everyone receives individual and family services. So if it's, if it's dad, if it's an unmarried partner that's part of that family, He's getting treatment too. He's not only on the master treatment plan, but he's getting individual and family services. Um, and the goals are for improved outcomes for women, children, and other family members, better parenting and family functioning. And it's every step in between here. And, and the, the, the booklet that, um, that we have that's free, that, I, uh, that has the address on it, um, uh, gives more detail about this. Um, but anyway, it shows you something to strive for. So if you find out that your programs are more down in level one and you'd like to be to level five, it gives you, you know, a roadmap of what you'd have to do to get there. Um, so uh, let's see, we got that in there. Um, just some, some, um, some effectiveness studies that have been done by the National Institute on Drug Abuse that the minimum uh, amount of treatment for an effective outcome is 90 days of residential or outpatient um, and 12 months is ideal. So, you know, there should be six weeks is nothing. You almost might as well not even bother if that's all you got. But 90 days is sort of the minimum threshold of intensity that is needed um, for a, um, for treatment to be effective according to, to the largest national studies done in the nation on drug treatment. Um, yeah? Is that 
that regular outpatient, like running to a clinic a week, or is that intended? The problem is it mixed and matched, so you, we, we can't say. But I understand, and, and there isn't, you know, this speaks to the issue of is outpatient or intensive outpatient better? Well, you know, it, and it's a double edged sword because the breathing in once a week is probably not going to help many people that have child welfare, that their drug addiction is so bad that they have maltreatment going on in their family. Probably the one hour weekend isn't going to cut it. On the other hand, there's something called intensive outpatient, which every state defines differently, but in your state, is, I think three times a week for three hours minimum. The problem is that how many of you in this room could manage to be somewhere three times a week for three hours in the middle of the day, typically, or late afternoon, early evening? Especially you got kids if you're trying to support yourself and have a job, and if you don't have transportation and if you're in a rural community. So, so that even though that is a better scenario uh, from a dosage standpoint, it doesn't always play out well in rural communities either. Um, and so. Um, Really, there, that's again going back to why the apartment complex model is so good, is that you can provide holistic services right on site. You can do them in the evenings and the weekends, during the week. Um, you know, you've got staff there right on site uh, in apartments that are converted into to, uh, counseling offices. Um, and you've got that whole family that you can have your eyes and ears on at all times. Um, and th this information is in the handouts that I have given you in your packet. Um, also, people may need more than one treatment episode to achieve success. That we believe it's a, it's a cumulative effect, and that's why you'll see sometimes people going back two and three times before they have a stable recovery. And each time they kind of slide back down, but not as far as hitting bottom usually. So it's sort of a you know two steps forward, three steps back kind of thing. But they eventually are moving in the right trajectory. Um, and also the engagement and retention. Um, it's not enough if we build it; they will come. It really has to be engaging and it has to be meaningful. And, um, you know, a couple of examples I'll give and then I'm wrapping up here is, um, you know, anger management is a good example. You know, sometimes we say, oh, well, there's a lot of, there's a need for anger management because they're, they're abusing their kids and, you know, we, we think this is a, a skill that they need. So we give them something like, you know, the 10 step program for anger management. 10 steps. Like, how many of us actually have ever used the 10-step anger management program in our own lives? You, you know, if you put a gun to my head, I couldn't tell you more than one or two steps. You know, you can't, it's hard to retain that even if you're not a drug user, okay? And it's not practical, that kind of stuff. It's boring, typically. It's complex. It doesn't stick. It's not something that we're going to be able to use. Um, some of the things we do in treatment are absolutely outright boring. They're repetitive, they don't resonate, they're, they're done in large groups where they don't you don't really have any connection. And so, again, let's use our common sense here. You know, have you ever been through and seen what some of these treatment programs are? And, and did your gut instinct or did interviews you've had with clients tell you that they're getting their needs met? Um, I think about what we did at Safeport, and we made treatment exciting. We said, you are on a journey for the rest of your life. Think of this as an, a journey, as an adventure. And you're going to learn all kinds of things that you can actually use. You're going to be able to be more effective with your kids. You're going to feel like a more successful parent. You're going to get a GED if you don't have one. We're going to help you get a job if you need one. We're going to give you the job skills you need. We're going to make sure you have a safe and stable place to live. We're going to do all this in one program. Who wouldn't want that? You know, versus shopping around here and there and going helter skelter trying to mix and match all this together with no transportation, no resources, no family support. And so, and we did all kinds of very nurturing, um, very, very pleasant, and we taught cooking skills. We, we told, taught parents how to live within their budgets, how to make hamburger meat last for a week of, you know, today's lasagna is tomorrow's stir fry or whatever. We taught them how to do things that they could actually use. We taught them how to parent their kids more effectively. We taught kids how to behave better and how to have ways to express their issues so that they don't have to act out all the time and be difficult for their parents to manage. So, you know, if it's something that is really meeting the needs, clients, you don't have to beat the clients up to get them there. They will find a way to get there, and especially if they have even a little bit of support. So, um, you know, I, I would just really encourage you to, um, you know, re really relook at what's out there and what we can do to make some improvements. Know that our organization is um, um, here to help, and not just with programming, but also policy development, things like not penalizing 
kids' visitation with their moms if they're, because their mom used. Um, that the kid doesn't understand why that bonding was separated, why they're, they're not able to see mom. All they want to do is see mom typically, and if mom used, maybe they need a supervised visitation, but not, not withholding visitation like that. Um, so we look at, you know, we assist with some policy development, with some programming. Um, we don't have time to go through all that, but, um, but we do have a, a number of, of resources that we'll make available. Um, let's see, just want to show you a couple of, I do? Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. I only, I only need about ten. Okay. Um, well, thank you. So um, the um, this is the judge as, as the orchestra conductor, and sometimes judges do have to perform that leadership role, uh, and because of their position, can often get things done that others can't in terms of getting some leadership involvement and, and attention to some needed changes. Um, these are some resources that are available that are not part of our center. Um, I cannot recommend this enough, this one here called Child Center Practices for the Courtroom and Community. Um, and that is, um, uh, it only takes a couple hours to read it and um, is, is really uh, quite an amazing book. I would, I strongly recommend that. Uh, Helping Babies from the Bench Using the Science of Early Childhood Development. That's a, these are just different places you could go to get um, resources. Here are the online tutorials that we um, have available. The um, understanding substance abuse, uh, and this is from the three different perspectives, as I've shared with you. You would take whichever one of these uh, you, you know, you would want to learn, uh, you want to know more about these other systems, those are the ones you would take. And then um, these are just some manuals that we make available and you can download them free or we can send them to you. Um, this first one here, the screening and assessment, that's called the SAFER manual. That shows how to do a better job from the very time of the hotline call all the way through to do a better job identifying a substance use as a factor. Um, and some states use the UNCOPE. It's a four or five question screening tool that they embed in the interview so that every person that comes into child welfare, every parent gets some key questions asked about possible alcohol or drug use. It's free, it's, you know, just has can be embedded in a drop down screen or, um, and, and I do want to say that uh, when we did the first walkthrough of Nebraska's system, and we were in the training room and there was all these child welfare posters. It was your brand new, what was it called? Um, they were, they had just been laminated posters of step by step what you do. Yeah. Guess what one word wasn't on any of those posters? Not once. Substance abuse. We were, we were stunned. We were there doing a walkthrough and we're like, we kept looking and looking and, and they had just been, it was brand new, big shiny new program or whatever. And I know I'll probably get in trouble for saying that, but I mean, it wasn't there. So, uh, and that was just something kind of new kicked off. I think this was about maybe a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and, and there's probably somewhere that it's in there that maybe it just didn't show up on the posters, but it spoke volumes to us about, you know, really missing uh, a, a key thing here that is uh, going to trip up these cases. Um, and then this is introduction to cross system data sources. This is not the most um, exciting rating, but it does give you, uh, a, it's a good primer on uh, data sources that can be collected to, to teach you things about um, or to know what to look for, whether your system is working well. This one here is on the table over here. It's called Drug Testing and Child Welfare Practice and Policy Considerations. That's free and we, we ship some here for y'all to have and they're on the table. And you can also download them uh, on the internet. And all of our things that are free that you can download usually come with lots of tools and instruments, things you can literally print out and start using. You don't have to get permission, they're all public domain. And then um, Substance Abuse Specialists and Child Welfare Agencies and Dependency Courts, it's another good publication that's free and then my contact information. And all of that is in this um, handout here that is in your, um, your file, your portfolio. And then, and of course, this is what all the data that we've reviewed today came from, which was Nebraska specific. So I know we have covered a lot and I realize why I keep thinking I didn't have enough time is that the person before me finished early. So that was why I was um, sure I was out of my time. And, and, um, but I just wanna take a minute to ask uh, if people have any questions or comments. Does this make sense? Yeah. Where do you get the funding? Where, where do you start with the funding for your, your little community? Um, well, a judge that overheard this presentation in Sydney um, is 
he he asked some people to get out there and try to find some housing and by that afternoon they had identified these barracks um, and I'm working with them I have a conference call with them today at one to work on some of the details but um, I believe what they're going to do there is they're going to start with um, families that are child welfare substance involved that also are on economic assistance so that they have a way to pay for their own rent they're going to ask for they're going to start with families that volunteer or that are told, you know, we're really looking at out-of-home placement for your kids, but if you live in this communal campus, we would consider putting that decision off and see if you can handle additional um, exposure to your kids with some support and, and therapy. So they're gonna move those families in and the rent would be in the 250 per family range, which most of these families, the ones that they're expecting, can afford because they're on economic assistance. They're going to transport them during the day to the site, which is 12 miles away apparently, where the outpatient counseling is. So instead of offering it on campus, which is preferred, because there aren't funds right now, they're gonna to have to transport um, the kids are going to go to the regular schools. The, um, they're going to try to make sure there's uh, early childhood for the little ones that aren't school aged. Um, they're going to really scrub down the local communities for the volunteers to do literacy workers, to get some of the volunteers, you know, retired teachers to do some work with um, um, tutoring. Um, they're going to get public health to come do a group there now and then. They're, they're trying to get domestic violence and these other agencies to come to the campus to do some on-site programming and then the others would be done at the, um, the outpatient. They're using the existing staff that are treating these families not as families and not so successfully now. So they're, they're literally using existing resources. If they can get that far, which you know they've done a lot already in a week in terms of identifying the housing um, is uh, and I told them I would help them find other resources sometimes it helps to get like a small grant or something just to get going um, and it would put them in a position to be eligible for lots of other funding coming down the pike so um, they could they're going to start very basic um, and it won't be, you know, the, the huge therapeutic campus that I'm describing because that usually takes a little time to develop also if you don't have a startup grant. Um, the ones in Omaha and Lincoln um, are looking, it's um, St. Monica's and Heartland, is that right, Heartland? And NFC and KFC are, are looking at the same models, not in barracks, this is in other apartments that have been identified. Um, they're also looking at uh, the possibility of using funds that are currently being spent for out-of-home placements to keep families in home and divert those funds to support the cost of the, of the rent of the apartments. Um, the only thing that, that I think would be a better plan um, would be if there's a way to site staff actually at the apartments. You know, in other words, if you're renting an outpatient building down the street and instead you can use an apartment as you're, you know, like they do in, in Georgia, there's quite a bit of staff in these apartments. Um, they just, including child welfare staff, they just have an office there. So they're there, you know, during the day. Um, but there's lots of different models all over the country. They're all funded in different ways. Um, some have grants, some don't. Yeah. A couple of other funding ideas. Um, one is the rural development kinds of like, um, Nebraska has rural, I mean, that might be something that, you know, it's not a whole lot of money in the scale of things. Uh, another thing is the behavioral health regions, like in St. Monica said that the behavioral health region was quite interested because, and they can have, they can use their funds flexibly, they can pay rent even mm -hmm. because, you know, they save two people going to residential treatment. That pays for a lot of rent. And then having to pay for the residential treatment. And so this is paid for, they're saving and they have some flexibility. Mm -hmm. And the third thing that, don't bank on this because this will take a long time and it may not happen, but apparently Congress is, uh, is passing a bill now that is going to extend the opportunities for 4E waivers mm -hmm. for the state. And I don't think Nebraska has ever gotten a 4E waiver, uh, but it is for innovative programs or whatever for children to keep them mm -hmm. out of going into foster care. Right. And so I'm gonna talk to, but don't count on this, right. go for the other things. But if, in the meantime, I think this might be something that could be a really good 4E mm -hmm. waiver process. Right is to help fund these pro programs that might keep mm -hmm. uh, children out of foster care right. and then they could use for e funds right. to help pay. 
Well, and, and I'll say this, any, any treatment center or child welfare agency that has implemented these models will say two things. One, they will never go back to doing treatment the other way once they see what holistic family treatment looks like and feels like. And two, that there that was the best decision they ever made. Um, it, it's just, it's like a bell you can't unring at that point. You can't go back and, and treat mom over here and the kids over here by two separate systems and throw them a bone here and there and expect they're all gonna gel somehow into a magical family that gets along and that's healthy and healing. It just doesn't work. And so this approach of keeping the family intact and, and doing these holistic services um, is, is a no-brainer, especially if it can be done with existing resources. So, um, and I don't know if you have United Ways and groups like that that might help a little startup in a small community. Um, now in, um, where did I just come from, was um, um, Kansas had they got one started and they didn't have any money so they got all the local churches and faith community centers to adopt a room so they um and so they have they have like an older house that they rehabbed with i think some hud and homeless dollars and so every the faith community locally all has one room that they're in charge of so they make sure there's linens and a bed and a dresser and you know there's uh, child seats for the kids and they support essentially the families that are going into these rooms. And so there's lots of different ways that this is done. Um, and actually the nice thing about using an apartment model is you can bill Medicaid because in, uh, you, I know that this is a bad word to say in Nebraska, the IMD exclusion, it's called the Institute for Metal, Mental Disease Exclusion. And basically means that if you have more than 16 beds in a residential facility, it's considered an Institute for Mental Disease and you can't bill Medicaid um, for the most part unless you get some big waivers. So, these are not those because their family prepares their own meals. They, and sometimes the centers will take food stamps and they'll help prepare, teach families how to prepare meals for everybody using food stamps or whatever they have to work with. But basically th that is not, a, a, it's, it's not an institution. It's a residential, um, it's, a, it's homes for families and they pay their own rent. So you can build Medicaid. We build for um, life skills under Medicaid. Um, rehab option, I think it was called, is how we build for it in Safeport. Everybody build, builds different ways, but it's, it's usually you can also build. And the other thing is the big thing, I can't believe I forgot this, by, by moms not losing their kids, they're still Medicaid eligible. You know how normally when mom loses kids, the mom's not Medicaid eligible, so you have no way to pay for treatment for her. Well, if mom never loses the kids and she was otherwise Medicaid eligible, she still is in the apartment model. So it does leverage existing resources very nicely. And, and one of the reasons, I mean, from the child welfare, yeah, and the private companies are more flexible, but they don't have to pay for visit, supervision, right. they don't have to pay for transportation, they don't have to pay for foster care. Right. All of a sudden, you know, and rent is cheap in Nebraska. I don't know yeah. what it is around here, but five or six hundred dollars a month for an apartment. Three bedroom, yeah. Is, um, is sort of the drop in the bucket compared to those other. Yep. Yeah. And you could get, what is that, the uh, F, not FFA, the, um, who's the, the farm people and they come in and they'll teach you how to cook and how to keep your house clean and homemaking. Extension, extension home extension, fabulous, sorry. I, um, I do live in a town with only 1,600 people, but, um, but it's attached to a really big town, so I guess I don't, can't, can't count myself as rural, yeah. My question is, how do you balance when in your model and in the, the typical family, you have a mother with uh, uh, several children who may have different fathers, one may be in jail. If we have a substance abusing mother, but we have a father who is living in a separate community who is not substance abusing, we're going to place the children with that non-substance abusing father, aren't we? Are you saying that we keep those children with the mother on, and the risk that's involved in that so that she can get this treatment? Well, I'm saying that you have every family, ha you have to assess them individually, so there's no big pat rule for do it all the time, but, but you would do a thorough assessment, primarily looking for safety, and in substance abuse, and as you'll see in your own data, abuse is less likely, it's usually neglect that happens with substance using families, but either way, if they're living there on site, they have other moms and kids living in the same apartment, and you have staff there, you know, essentially 24 seven, you've got staff during the day, and then at night you've got your, your night monitor person. Um, your chances of having any kind of serious abuse or neglect in that public of a, 
of a venue is, is very limited. So it's, it is a risk, but it's a calculated risk. And that would go to saying, you know, first of all, do we know for sure that, that dad is even really not drug using? Because that's also a big fallacy. Often they're better at hiding it. You know, often they're the ones that introduce mom. Same thing with family members. Like, how do you think mom became a drug u user to begin with? And if she has bipolar, that might be a family history and you're sending the kids to live with grandmom. I mean, so we do that sometimes. We do the same thing you're suggesting, not always knowing these details when we ship the kids off to mom, mom's mother or mom's boyfriend or, or, or mom's um, the father of the, of the children. So it, yes, it is a risk, but you do have to do a thorough evaluation and see whether or not a family it, you know, it could be safe in this environment. And so what the states that have done this have found is that it's not for every family. It's certainly in the egregious situations, you might not do that. But in it also may be a situation where mom can move in with maybe one child and maybe the other older kids might be with dad and then they get integrated over time or through some kind of visitation process. Every family's plan is very different. Um, but you would do a thorough safety assessment. Mom is not living out in a trailer in the middle of nowhere. Mom is living on a campus with lots of eyes and ears, child welfare staff in and out every day, every day or during the week anyway um, at the program. And so it's not a, a, an isolated kind of thing. And I don't know if that answers your question. There's, there's no easy answer. You still have to, to individualize your decisions. Other questions? Some state, and I don't remember what it was, does it only it started this with voluntary families when you don't really even have any leverage, and so you're, you've got a voluntary family, and that's another use of sort of preventing it from getting to that extreme. But um, you know, that's that's just going to be based on your own assessment, and you'd want to make sure you have a good assessment tool to do that, and and lots of, of um, supervision. Any other questions, comments? Um, I'll be around um, a bit for today. I have a one o'clock, I think, call with uh, Sydney, who's continuing their planning, but it's been a pleasure, and I appreciate your time and attention.